When Leonidas Lafayette Polk and his family moved into their new home in a fashionable Raleigh neighborhood in 1891, he was a man at the peak of his career. His fine house, located on Person Street a few blocks from its present site, was a symbol of his success. Both he and the city had risen to a proud height over the preceding decade, and now Colonel Polk was poised to take another giant step forward. As head of the National Farmers Alliance, he became, by early 1892, the leading spokesman of a new political party, the People's or Populist Party, and was its likely nominee for President of the United States. Colonel Polk readied himself for this stage with an exhausting cross-country speaking tour. At the same time, wife Sarah settled in, with the help of her two grown daughters, to life in the capital city. Raleigh, with a population of close to 13,000, was fast becoming a booming commercial center. It had a brand new city hall and railroad station, cotton mills, tobacco warehouses, over 30 churches, electric streetcars, colleges, and even an opera house under construction. Since the mid-1880s, Colonel Polk had spent most of his time traveling, so the family rented homes in Raleigh for many years. By 1890, Sarah was clearly ready to put down roots. It was she who bought a lot in the Oakwood neighborhood, Raleigh's first true suburb. Houses there were designed in a variety of Victorian styles to suit the city's merchants, lawyers, doctors, and civic leaders. The Polk's home, with its delicately patterned wallpaper, fine furniture, and welcoming wraparound porch, represented how far they had come from their isolated farm back in Anson County, where, after the Civil War ended, they had to start their lives over from scratch. The war had been a defining time for Polk. In 1860, he had been a wealthy 23-year-old farmer, happily married and serving as one of the youngest members in the North Carolina legislature. Orphaned at age 15, he had inherited 600 acres and several slaves. In his native Anson County, slaves outnumbered whites and brought prosperity to cotton-growing plantation families like the Polks. Still, young Leonidas did not support Southern secession. Elected to the legislature as a Whig, he vowed that he was going to be a Union man, exerting all my power to aid in averting civil war. When the war did come, Polk joined the Confederate Army. In 1865, Polk returned home to Anson. He had lived five years as a soldier, fought in three states, and was wounded at Gettysburg. When I returned at the close of the war, he later remembered, I found my home desolate and ruined. The Union Army had laid waste to the land. His former slaves had been given freedom without money to buy land or seed, so they, along with many impoverished whites, faced the grim prospect of farming as sharecroppers. All over North Carolina, farmers had to learn how to get by with no resources beyond the soil they tilled and their own energy and ingenuity. Many put all their effort into growing tobacco and cotton, crops that could fetch a high price or be nearly worthless, depending on the market. On his own farm, however, Colonel Polk diversified crop production so that he would not have to depend on uncontrollable prices. He was even able to found a new town, Polkton, to take advantage of the Central Carolina Rail Line when it came through his land. In 1874, he began a weekly newspaper, The Ansonian, which became the bullhorn for his views. Polk's ideas were influenced by the Grange Movement, which increased cooperation among farmers. With growing influence, he urged the state to improve its agriculturally-based economy by harnessing new technologies, science, and financial restructuring. In the 1870s, Polk began a lonely crusade to create a State Department of Agriculture. His efforts finally succeeded thanks to his friend and former regiment leader, Governor Zeb Vance. Polk became the department's first commissioner in 1877 and initiated many reforms. The department began testing fertilizers, tracking crop production statewide, and urging diversified farming as well as easier loans for the farmers. Impatient with his conservative board, however, Polk left the post after three years. Through the early 1880s, Polk tried out several ventures, some unsuccessful, but he wouldn't abandon the farmers, 
who were slipping increasingly into debt as crop prices continued to fall. In 1886, Polk published the first issue of The Progressive Farmer. It quickly became the South's leading newspaper for farmers and has retained its national prominence since then, especially through its popular spin-off, Southern Living, begun in 1960. Polk devoted most of the progressive farmers' pages to practical problems that farm families faced, but he also pushed a bold political agenda, urging readers to join local farmers' clubs to forge a stronger collective voice. He wrote in his magazine's pages, Our farmers buy everything to raise cotton and raise cotton to buy everything. And after going through this treadmill business for years, they lie down and die and leave their families penniless. Polk also lobbied persistently for a new college focused on the practical arts, using the progressive farmer to champion this cause. When the North Carolina College of Agriculture and Mechanic Arts was founded in Raleigh in 1887, Polk was recognized as one of the founders of what became North Carolina State University. Not long afterward, he stirred his denomination to create a Baptist seminary for young women, which became Meredith College. With amazing energy, Polk worked during these same years to promote the Farmers' Alliance movement. The Alliance had risen quickly since its start in Texas in the late 1880s. Polk's passion and eloquence made him perhaps the organization's most effective leader. He was elected head of the two million member group in 1890. One North Carolina newspaper commented, some Alliance men seem to have more confidence in him than in God. In 1891, as Sarah guided the construction of their new home not far from the state capitol, Polk gained unprecedented control over state politics with the help of the farmer's vote. The farmer's legislature during that term increased the tax rate to support public schools, established new colleges for women and for blacks, and approved regulation of the railroads. By 1892, Polk was ready to present what was nothing less than a populist revolution to the nation. In February, he called for the Great West, the Great South, and the Great Northwest to link their hands and hearts together and march to the ballot box and take possession of the government and run it in the interest of the people. With this stirring call, he became the certain presidential nominee of the People's Party. Yet his health had been terribly damaged from ceaseless work. On June 11th, he was struck down with a hemorrhaging bladder as he traveled by train from Raleigh to Washington, D.C. He died there and was buried the next day in Oakwood Cemetery, Raleigh, not far from his new home. Colonel Polk's ultimate successor as editor of The Progressive Farmer, Clarence Poe, wrote upon Polk's death that every farmer in the land is a mourner. For a few years, populists made gains in national politics, but before 1900, the party's influence had waned. Sarah Polk lived in her beloved house on Person Street until her death in 1901, when it became the home of daughter Juanita Denmark and her family. The house remained in the family until the 1960s. From its permanent place on Blunt Street, near the governor's mansion and the capital that Colonel Polk knew so well, his home reminds visitors of his progressive vision, his large-heartedness, and his lasting impact on both North Carolina and the nation. <laughs>